240 volt system is 400 and something volts. Okay. Now most domestic houses run on, um, they have to have a stable voltage within certain limits, perhaps between 210 and 240 volts, and they run on 50 hertz, 50 cycles per second, give or take a very small tolerance, okay? But generators spinning around on top of your wind turbine are spinning at various rates, so the frequency is completely variable depending on how fast it's turning, and it's also producing variable voltage depending again on the speed at which it's turning and the load that's on it. And this kind of electricity that comes off a generator is known as wild alternating current. So what we always do <coughs> is we have to convert that electricity to direct current. So you rectify it by putting it through a series of diodes and those diodes only allow the electricity to flow one way and so you trap both sides of the electricity to positive and negative and separate the alternating current into direct current and you can store in batteries. Or if you're grid tying it, you do the same thing, you run it through the rectifiers, you straighten it into DC with a positive and negative separated, and then you feed it into a grid tie inverter, and the grid tie inverter takes that DC and converts it into alternating current that has been controlled to match the frequency and voltage of the current that's coming into your house from your utility company. So looking at the battery system version of this, the electricity usually goes through a charge controller and the charge controller usually has a rectifier here, there's a rectifier bank on the side of the, the probe and charge controller and it converts it into direct current and then it controls the voltage. The battery up to a point will control the voltage by taking the load but if the battery voltage goes over a certain limit it means that your batteries are either overcharging or are overcharged and it starts to switch in dump load. So there's a voltage sensor that senses if the voltage on our 24 volt system goes above 28.5 volts, it kicks in a 500 watt load. If it continues to go above 28.8 volts, it kicks in another load, and so on. And ultimately, if it continues to go over voltage, it throws a resistor into the wind windings of the motor and um, stalls the motor, so stalls the generator, and slows it all down. Okay? <coughs> the batteries that are used. Um, have to be capable of withstanding deep cycles. And the kind of batteries that are designed for deep cycling are forklift batteries, batteries used for leisure, you know, for boats quite often have batteries that they use for lighting and for so on when the boat is, is in harbour, or golf buggies, you know. So various batteries that are designed for deep cycle are what you must use for, um, for a battery based system. And even at that, most of the batteries, like forklift batteries, they're not designed to sit on low charges for long periods of time. If you really want to look after batteries in a, in a battery-based wind power system, you ideally should try and either seriously oversize your batteries so that you're not deep cycling them too much, or else you should have a standby generator and recharge them. If the weather forecast is looking bad, recharge your batteries. And then you would have a battery inverter, and that battery inverter would convert the low voltage DC into, uh, into high voltage AC. So it would typically use a, um, a transformer and produce a, a synthetic sine wave. <coughs> okay, and it also usually protects the battery from, from being totally discharged by cutting out once the battery goes below a certain voltage. Okay, the inverter can be either a true sine wave inverter which produces an absolutely true sine wave electronically. Or you can sometimes get these quite low cost um, modified sine wave inverters. Now there's a, there's a function for both of them within any battery based system, right? So if you have um, a number of items that are on at all times, like, um, you know, say the, 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 the a clock or a, you know, a timer on a cooker or some sort of, you know, all sorts of low voltage appliances, fans maybe, things that are on 24-7 if you have heat exchange ventilation for example. You might run them using a, a separate circuit, one, one of these inverters, and then your main sockets that are going to your television, your um, fridges, freezers, and um, particularly pop-up posters and other heavy appliances would be run off the other inverter, and that inverter would cut in and out according to the, according to the demand on the system. Okay, 
So that's, you might actually have one of each type of inverter in the house. So this is an outback inverter. It's um, two kilowatts. They're, they're stackable. You can put two, three, four of them together. They come in two kilowatt, three kilowatt units. They're quite a good sine wave inverter, true sine wave inverter. This is the one that we have in our house. It's a trace <coughs> inverter. It's able to continuously feed three and a half kilowatts, but it's got a peak of about four, four and a half kilowatts. Okay, about 4,000 euros. This gear is expensive. There's not an awful lot of it made. There's not many people have battery-based systems. So the prices are quite high. You've got a lot of extra cost in putting in battery-based systems. And this is a typical modified sine wave inverter that you might leave on, leave it running continuous circuits that are on at all times. Okay. Um, you might also decide that with small resistive loads, such as lighting, um, that you would actually run them directly off the batteries. Okay. In our case, we've dual wired our house. We've wired our lighting using um, using cable designed to take DC and low voltage. So all our lights run on 24 volt DC. If you are doing that, and if you're wiring your house for direct current, it's important that you use stranded wire. You must never use solid copper, like the solid copper 2.5 twin in our You never use that on a DC circuit. If you look at any of the wiring in your car, it's always stranded wire. And that's because in, a <coughs> in an AC circuit, the, wire, the, the electrons vibrate up and down the same piece of wire. Okay, They don't actually move around the circuit. In a DC situation, the electrons physically move around the circuit, and they move more easily along the surface of the wire. So you use high surface area stranded wire to maximize the ability of the electrons to flow. Also, if you're using <coughs> DC circuits, you can't use MCBs. You must use a fuse. We use Neo Z fuses, but you must use the old fashioned wire fuse. DC, low voltage, doesn't work with MCBs. Okay, so we've got a fuse board like this in our house for fusing the DC circuits. Okay. <coughs> Assuming that you're not going for a battery system and you're going for a grid tie system, you're then going to need a grid tie inverter. And uh, the popular ones in the market are the, the ones from SMA, Windy Boy and Sunny Boy. And then there's also the, um, the ones that we do, which is the Aurora ones, the ones we use here. The Windy Boy um, can take any sort of voltage from your turbine between 200 and 500 volts DC, and it converts it into a regulated AC, and that electricity is absolutely in phase with the, the grid. Okay? And similarly, the Aurora, um, this inverter here, which is quite a heavy wee box, that's the Aurora inverter, and it um, can take the beauty of this is that it can take any voltage between 50 volts DC and 580 volts, right? So once the turbine starts spinning, when it gets up to it spinning at a rate that is producing more than 50 volts, this inverter is able to come online and start um, tying it into the mains. There are certain standards that these inverters must meet. One of them is that they have to, um, in, in, in a situation, it's called islanding, where the grid is disconnected, they must shut off within half a second. Okay? So and that's because if you have some ESP people working on lines, they think they've switched off the power, you've got some fool at the mountain whacking in 240 volts into it, you'd kill them. So <coughs> there's always um, very strict safety regulations on these inverters, and there's a cutoff time. And this is part of the standards determined by EN 50438, which is the new European standard that applies in Ireland. But your, your, your inverter must meet whichever standard your u local utility company is insisting on as the standard for safety. And the, the cable between this inverter and the fuse board must be sized such that there's no more than a 1% voltage drop across that cable. Now that's easily met provided that it's in the same room. Normally, you connect this quite simply into a fuseway in the consumer unit, in the fuse board. So you put in another MCB and you connect it in there. And the electricity then seamlessly goes up or down the wire, either into the household supply or back out into the, into the grid according to whether it's needed or not. And all of that connection work has to be done by a registered, qualified electrician. Okay? The utility is going to insist on that for safety reasons. 